thank you all for joining today. I'm Chris Wirth, the graduate student at the department. I'm excited to present our speaker, uh, my good friend and entomological mentor, Dr. Art Evans. Uh, Art's going to be talking about his latest book, Beetles of Western North America, a really, truly ambitious project. <laughs> Take it away, Art. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, let me see if I can advance my screen. There we go. Um, here are a couple of my bona fides. Uh, I'm a trustee and research associate at the Virginia Museum of Natural History. Uh, I'm also a research associate at the California State Collection of Arthropods in Sacramento, and I'm a research collaborator at the Smithsonian. Um, as a real job, uh, I work as an adjunct uh, professor teaching uh, entomological courses at Randolph-Macon College, University of Richmond, and Virginia Commonwealth University here in the uh, greater Richmond area. Um, I have broad interests in terms of uh, entomology, although I'm primarily a, a coleopterist, and, um, but I'm fortunate to be able to work wearing a number of different hats. I've had a long standing interest in informal science education, uh, as well as teaching in a university setting. Um, I've uh, also a radio broadcaster. I uh, had a, a, a short uh, insect uh, uh, radio segment that aired on Richmond Public Radio during NPR's Morning Edition, which recently was turned into a short video series. And uh, I do conduct a bit of research when I have time. And I've written several books. Uh, about uh, uh, insects and other arthropods, especially uh, my first love, beetles. Speaking of which, that's what brings me here today. This is shameless self-promotion of my latest book, uh, Beetles of Western North America. Uh, it covers uh, 1,428 species of beetles across 131 families that occur west of the Continental Divide. And I thought I'd share with you a couple of features uh, about this book. Um, first of all, the study area, it does cover everything west of the uh, continental divide from Alaska to Western Mexico. However, the focus of the book are species that occur primarily from Southern British Columbia down to Southern California and uh, across Southern Arizona. There's an extensive introduction to the book laying out a beetle morphology uh, also uh, larval types. Uh, I was very pleased that this uh, spread turned out the way it did, that you can just open up the book uh, to a page and see lots of different larval types all in one place. The book focuses primarily on adults, but uh, um, uh, having some information about larvae is important. And I'm hoping that as successive generations of coleopterists come online, that they'll have uh, uh, even more opportunities to work with the larvae too. There's also information about their behavior and uh, natural history. And uh, one of the little uh, essays that I've included was a story that was really interesting to me. This is my friend, Anna Holden, and she did some research on the remains of beetles and other arthropods found in a 40,000 year old camel skull that was unearthed from the La Brea tar pits uh, in Los Angeles. And what's interesting about this cache of uh, uh, parts is, is that these are uh, mostly all modern species. These are species that are extant today, but they may not necessarily be found in the Los Angeles basin. But this treasure trove of uh, arthropods uh, gives a good indication as to what the uh, paleoclimate was in the LA area about 40,000 years ago. Based on bits and pieces of plant materials found in the tar pits over time, it was thought that the uh, Los Angeles area about 40,000 years ago was much cooler and wetter. But the insect evidence indicates this was not the case. It was actually warmer and probably drier uh, at that time. One of the really cool things that was discovered was this uh, head and pronotum that was discovered and it belongs to this extant beetle uh, this is uh, Necrobia violacea. This is one of the ham beetles. And it was originally thought that this beetle was distributed by uh, the Spanish and later the Europeans that were colonizing Western and Eastern uh, parts of North America. But here's clear fossil evidence, or I shouldn't say these aren't truly fossils there. It's actual chitin that we're seeing. 
But here's evidence that this beetle was already in North America 40,000 years ago, long before humans would have been bringing them, uh, carrying them along. So uh, it's possible that this species is whole Arctic in distribution, or uh, it's even possible that it was uh, primarily North American and taken back to Europe where it's become well established. We won't know the, the extent of uh, that situation for some time, I suspect. There's also information detailing uh, various collecting uh, methods uh, for uh, beetles. Uh, on the left is my friend Dave Carlson, who's got a couple of pool nets strapped to a, a bridge over a canal that runs along the western slopes of the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. There's lots of bits and pieces of leaves and vegetation and insects, including beetles, that are constantly coming down this stream. And many rare species have been collected this way. And uh, there's a couple of papers documenting this collection method. Matt Gimmel is next from the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. And he's demonstrating one of the many ways you can use a shallow tray for collecting insects, uh, beetles. You can use it as a beating tray, or you can put handfuls of leaf litter, rotten wood, or moss and carefully pick through it. Next is uh, Bob Anderson, uh, weevil man extraordinaire from the Canadian Museum of Nature. And he's using a sifter to extract uh, beetles and, and uh, other arthropods uh, that will then be placed in uh, extractors and uh, allowed to air dry. And here's Chris Wirth uh, inspecting a black light, uh, attracting all kinds of beetles and other insects in southeastern Arizona. Uh, Ron McPeak uh, is uh, looking at this uh, slash pile in Oregon. For years, I had uh, read about slash piles as being very productive, but I never seemed to be in the right place at the right time. This slash pile and those around it was some of the most productive collecting I've ever done in my life. Uh, Ted McRae is on the right demonstrating how to use a beading sheet uh, using his uh, Net handle is a beating stick, so you don't have to carry too many things when you're out and about in the field. Also, uh, I highlight some different trapping methods that are very productive for beetles. One of the most interesting trapping methods that's become very popular in the last couple of years is what we call the V-fit trap, or it's a V-shaped flight intercept trap. And this is simply a piece of uh, uh, plastic sheet that's uh, suspended between two frames and then weighed down in the middle. And at the low point, there are pans of uh, uh, fluid uh, for collecting insects that hit these panels and come in. For those of you that use malaise traps to collect insects, yes, some beetles will make the trip all the way up into the collection jar, but many don't. They hit the uh, panels and fall to the ground, never to be seen again. But this, uh, these panels direct the beetles downward uh, into the collecting fluid where they can be scooped up every few days or once a week. This is a very classic yet very simple dung collecting trap. This is literally poop on a stick. Uh, you take uh, feces of any kind, you pick your favorite, uh, put a ball of it on the end of a stick, put it over a buried bowl with some collecting fluid and within hours you'll have lots of beetles. Uh, here we've taken a two liter uh, uh, soda bottle, cut off the neck, uh, cut off the top and right at the shoulders and invert it so it becomes a funnel and then put in your favorite bait, chopped up bananas. Uh, you can use malt baits, uh, throw in a little beer, sugar, whatever have you, some sort of fermenting material. This is something I was just playing around with but I thought I'd feature it in the book. This is a corn cob feeder. Um, you know, they cost a few bucks um, but you can pick up uh, pick them up at a, a hardware store, big box hardware store, and they're designed so you can put corn cobs in them and use them as bird feeders or squirrel feeders, depending. But if you replace that with uh, bananas or plantains or oranges or peaches and put them out, depending on where you are, they can become a magnet for beetles. Here we've got Cotinus uh, mutabilis, the uh, western uh, uh, peach beetle or fig beetle. Uh, there's one euphoria tucked away in here, and uh, this was just after one day. Also in the book is a key to the common beetle families found in Western North America. Uh, this is kind of a fool's errand to have a key that will cover all of the species that you might encounter west of the Continental Divide. But uh, what I've put together is a very simple key that groups families, uh, lumps them into groups, and then you can compare 
your specimen with pictures of those families represented in the book. Uh, so it covers uh, 91 of the 131 families that are known to occur east of the western, or excuse me, east of the Continental Divide. The most likely families are highlighted in bold, and of course they're cross-referenced with page numbers, so you can go right to those pages. And if nothing materializes there, then you can see some of these other families that uh, also fall in this category as well. I've used the Eastern version of this key with my students for several years, and it works uh, fairly well. And of course, the heart of the book are the uh, family uh, diagnoses and species diagnoses. And the book is arranged uh, phylogenetically. There's a pronunciation guide to the family. There's a short uh, uh, description of the natural history of this particular family. There's a family diagnosis. And also there's information for comparing this family with other families that it's likely to be confused with. And also notes on collecting. I do not shy away from the importance of collecting beetles and uh, having voucher specimens to support all studies. All ecological studies that mention beetles or any insects for that matter ought to be accompanied by reliably identified voucher specimens because those are the uh, permanent records that can be then referred to uh, for generations afterwards. Also, uh, I have a, a quick note as to the fauna of that family. So there are four species in one genus found in North America. And then as you go through the different uh, species diagnoses, there's information for separating them from other species, uh, species in the genus, little bits of information about their natural history and also their approximate uh, distribution. You'll notice that these are followed by numbers in parentheses. That indicates the total number of species in that genus west of the continental divide. So when you see a low number, like a one or a two or a three, you can be reasonably confident that this picture will help you separate uh, the species that you have. If you see a high number, uh, you better be careful in identifying a species based solely on the photograph. Now you'll notice too that I include the names of the authorities. So that's part of the scientific name. And you'll num notice that a number of these authorities names keep popping up over and over again. If there was a Western version of a Mount Rushmore dedicated to uh, the important uh, coleopterists here in North America, this might be what it looks like, where we have Casey, Fall, LeConte, Horn, and Van Dyke. And I wanted to take a few minutes to highlight the uh, contributions of these coleopterists. Uh, top among them is John Lawrence LeConte. Uh, he was one of the most eminent entomologists of the 19th century. He described some 5,000 new species of beetles, many of which occurred in Western North America. He was a pioneer in the classification of beetles, and he's considered to be the father of American beetle study. One of his uh, close colleagues is George Horn, and Horn arrived in California during the Civil War, and where he uh, collected beetles throughout the state, as well as in parts of Arizona and Nevada. Horn described 154 new genera and more than 1,600 species. And upon LeConte's death in 1883, he became the preeminent coleopterist uh, in North America. Thomas Lincoln Casey collected beetles in California from San Francisco and Eureka, uh, mainly North, or from San Diego, excuse me, to Eureka from 1855 to 1886 and secured a wealth of material. He was also a wealthy individual, so he purchased a lot of collections too. He has the record. He described nearly 10,000 new species in 40 years, publishing almost 9,000 pages on their taxonomy and biology. But much of Casey's work has been criticized as many of his species were synonyms of previously described taxa. Now it's important to note that for many of the smaller species and for the less known families of beetles, his work is held up, but for a lot of uh, species where they're much larger, much better known, his species concepts um, were not uh, what we consider to be uh, reliable because he tended to separate species on the basis of very minor characters based on individual variation. Henry Clinton Fall made significant contributions to the study of beetles in North America, especially in the West. And it's interesting to note that he was, uh, although he had been interested in beetles for about 15, 20 years, 
He didn't publish anything until 1893. And this first publication was inspired by a George, uh, a visit from George Horn, who came out to California then to do sort of a, a final tour. He was getting along in years and uh, uh, he had been corresponding with the young Fall. And uh, that visit inspired Fall to publish uh, the first of many important papers. Uh, his collection was one of the largest private beetle collections of its day. It contained over 200,000 specimens representing 20,000 species. And his collection now resides with those of LeConte and Horn at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. You can go online and see many of the type specimens of species that were described by LeConte, Horn, and Fall. Edwin Van Dyke was an outstanding authority of beetles of the Pacific States. Uh, he was also an expert on forest insects and the distribution of insects, especially beetles in Western North America. He published a number of papers on their distributions and had some very uh, interesting ideas. He was very well ahead of his time in terms of his understanding of uh, insect distributions in North America. He was also an inspirational teacher as well as an enthusiastic and very conscientious collector. He uh, was very careful not to disturb habitats, to put things back in their place uh, when he was collecting in an area. He too amassed a huge collection of beetles, 200,000 specimens, and it was presented to the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco in 1924. This is no small thing because the entomology collection at the Cal Academy was virtually destroyed by fire after the earthquake in 1906. So his donation to that collection really jump-started uh, the entomology collection there, especially in beetles. Now I wanna take a moment just to talk about how I came to write this book, uh, Beetles of Western North America. Um, I began collecting insects. I've always been interested in insects. I was one of those kids that grew up putting things in jars, wondering what they were. Uh, and reading about them in the library. But it wasn't until 1970 that I was at the tender age of 13, that's me there at 13, with my very first insect net that my mom sewed together for me using a, uh, a coat hanger uh, for a net loop and a, a, a mop handle for a net. Um, that's when I began collecting insects. And I still remember the very first beetle that I pinned, it was right through the prothorax. I still try to get students not to do that today, but you know, it's a process, we're all learning. Um, I was very involved in 4-H. Some of you might have been members of 4-H when you were coming along. Uh, my family didn't have rabbits, goats, chickens, horses, guide dogs, or any of the other things that 4-H uh, is typically uh, associated with, but I had an insect collection. And one day we had a demonstration day and I had my uh, insect collection, which at that time was in four cigar box boxes and they were neatly laid out uh, on a card table inside the building. And I was all by myself. Everybody else was out with their, uh, their animals, uh, sharing them with people and so on. And this gentleman on the left, Chris Tenney walked in and introduced himself and he was the first entomologist I ever met. He was hired as a preparator at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles right after World War II and worked there for several years. And he mentioned names of people that he worked there with that I knew right away, uh, Lepidopterist Lloyd Martin and John Adams Comstock. Well, anyway, from that chance meeting, he set up a, uh, a behind the scenes field trip for me at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles with my 4-H group. And that was like a, a huge moment for me. It was like jumping into hyperspace. My interest and my opportunities uh, in entomology just expanded tremendously at that point. On that very first trip to the Natural History Museum, I met this gentleman on the right, Bob Duff. Um, Bob was just a, a few years older than myself he was interested primarily in scarab beetles. At that time, I was interested in all insects and, and even uh, many arthropods too. But he invited me to join him on a field trip to southeastern Arizona in 1973. I had just gotten my driver's license so I could help uh, drive the vehicle and off we went. And I, I always collected insects on family trips, but this was the first time I had an opportunity to go on a trip that was dedicated uh, to collecting insects. And uh, over the next five years, we covered a lot of territory on extended trips throughout Southern California, Arizona, uh, Southern New Mexico, and even into 
Western Texas. Bob was the one that introduced me to the diversity of uh, beetles in the Southwest. I'm sorry to say that Bob passed uh, earlier this year. Um, through my, uh, that first meeting at the Natural History Museum, I met the curators there, Roy Snelling, a well-known hymenopterist, Ant-Man, Julian Donahue, uh, lepidopterist specializing primarily in Arcteids or Arcteines, I should say, uh, and Charlie Hogue, who was a very important mentor to me as well. Charlie was a specialist on Diptera, uh, Blepharocerids in particular, but he also wrote popular books. He gave a lot of lectures and he was a superb insect photographer. And he's the one that spurred my interest in uh, popular entomology um, and photography, although that didn't really take hold until many years later. Uh, it was at the end of my stint at the Natural History Museum where I worked as a student worker in entomology that I decided to attend Cal State Long Beach uh, studying under Albert Sleeper figured on the left here. Uh, Dr. Sleeper was a world authority on weevils and uh, I was anxious to uh, start focusing. I already put two years in at a community college. I was interested in uh, finishing up my uh, bachelor's degree in entomology. On my right is Chuck Bellamy. Uh, Chuck uh, was a master's student when I got into as, a, as an undergrad at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, Chuck went on to become a world authority uh, on Buprestids and became one of my best friends and college roommates and later was my co-author on one of my very first uh, books. Um, it was Chuck that encouraged me to travel to South Africa and enroll in the University of Pretoria to earn my doctorate in entomology. In the upper left-hand corner there, you can see us all on our very first morning uh, and my first extended trip in Africa, we were in Malawi. It was brutally hot, humid, and there was something walking around our camp all night. So none of us slept very well. So if you see a lot of long, grim faces, uh, that's why. The gentleman in the short standing on the right is Clark Skoltz. Uh, he was my professor at the University of Pretoria. Some of you might recognize his name because he's involved in a lot of excellent dung beetle studies uh, in Southern Africa. On the right, uh, pictured with me is Marcus Byrne. Uh, Marcus was a student at uh, Witts University in Johannesburg. Uh, here we're picking through a carcass of a uh, zebra uh, looking for beetles. Uh, Marcus, you may recall, has a, a wonderful TED talk uh, on the dance of the dung beetles, how beetles use the sun and the stars to navigate. And if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend that you do. And his book, Dance with the Dung Beetles, just came out. Um, so it's really fun to see how all of us have kept our hand in the game. Uh, below are some of the species of beetles that I collected while I was in South Africa. My studies focused on uh, the melolanthines of sub-Saharan uh, Africa. Even though much of my time these days is spent teaching and writing, um, I do try to keep my hand in with research. And I'm working with a colleague at the Canadian Museum of Nature uh, in Ottawa, uh, Andrew Smith, and we're working on uh, a, a, a revision of the melolanthines of uh, the New World. And just last year, we had a paper published in uh, Zootaxa on the tribal classification of the Nearctic melolanthony. For now, all of the genera finally have a home. This is something that hasn't always been the case. When I say home, a tribe. We also, uh, for the first time, uh, described the only known specimen of a female of uh, the genus Acoma. The males are very well known. They're attracted to lights. They're ready flyers, but the females are flightless and there's only one specimen known and it's in the Canadian Museum of Nature. So this is the first time that it's been fully uh, described. Um, after I came back from South Africa, um, I was offered a job as a technician in the entomology department uh, at, the, at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles. Thanks to my connections with the three previously mentioned curators, I came home to a job right away. And I was started looking for a job uh, at a university um, uh, or a museum because I wanted to pursue systematics. But I've always had a longstanding uh, interest in science education, informal science education. The museum had just received a $2 million grant to start an insect zoo. Now I realize insect zoos are everywhere now, but back in the 1980s, 
um, there were only three insect zoos. There was one at the Smithsonian, the Cincinnati Zoo, and also the San Francisco Zoo. So I had the opportunity to build uh, the fourth insect zoo in the United States from the ground up. And I did that um, and became its director. And that's where I worked for 10 years. And I built a, uh, a cradle to grave insect program. We had programs for teaching uh, nursery school children about insects. Uh, we uh, went out to schools and summer camps and shopping centers with live insects and talked to students of different ages. We even did workshops with teachers, encouraging them to bring insects into their classrooms and include them in their uh, curricula. And I worked there until 2000, until I moved here in Richmond, Virginia. Um, during my tenure at the insect zoo, I had an opportunity to write my first book, An Inordinate Fondness for Beetles. This is a coffee table book. And I accepted it immediately. I thought this was a great opportunity. And then I went into a panic. I thought, who am I to write a book on beetles? I'm just getting started in my career. This is something a mid-career or a uh, uh, late-career entomologist writes, not a young career entomologist. So I got my good friend Chuck Bellamy to join me. He had just moved to South Africa. And uh, fortunately, there was this new technology that was just taking hold called electronic mail or email which made it very easy to transmit uh, chapters uh, back and forth. And so that's how we uh, wrote this book, which came out in 1996. And just a few years later, uh, a Japanese edition became available as well. Um, also during my tenure at the Natural History Museum, I was given the opportunity to contribute to uh, American Beetles. This is the handbook of identification for North America, and I wrote the section on melolanthine scarabs and provided a key. I was also invited to write a section of beetles in this natural history of the Sonoran Desert. And uh, this is a publication uh, that was put together by both the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum and also the University of California. It just so happened that the University of California Press picked up the soft cover version of an inordinate fondness for beetles. And at the book launch at the Arizona Soren Desert Museum, um, I was gonna make a point of approaching the uh, editor at UC Press and pitch another book idea I had on the Beatles of California. And when I did, um, she loved the idea and I told her what I wanted to do. And she said, well, that sounds like it's gonna be two books. And so that's how these books were born. Introduction to California Beatles, which is literally that, it's not a field guide. Um, uh, it talks about the history of beetle collecting. It has an overview of the families. And I wrote it with my good friend, Jim Hogue, who is Charlie Hogue's son. So it was great to uh, work with another Hogue. Um, and uh, he's an excellent photographer and illustrator as well. And then a few years later, we combined our talents and did the field guide to the Beatles of California. Both these books are out of print now. They're the only books I have at the moment. They're out of print. So if you find them and you're interested, grab them because they're not readily available. Um, after I moved to uh, Virginia, um, I worked uh, primarily uh, on contract work. I did uh, popular articles. I did a little bit of research. Um, I started teaching as an adjunct professor at uh, uh, universities here. But the opportunity came up to uh, write my first book with Princeton University Press, Beatles of Eastern North America. Some of you might be familiar with this work. The Western book is very similar to this. And another book that I worked on uh, right after the Eastern book was the Book of Beatles. Um, I was one of uh, several contributing authors. Some of you may be familiar with this book. It's published here in the United States by the University of Chicago Press. I know Chris Wirth contributed photographs to this book. Um, what uh, is interesting about this is that there are 600 species, profiles of 600 beetle species covering 220 families from around the world. And the hook, uh, one of many hooks with this uh, publication is that each profile includes a photo, two photos of a species, one of which is life size and the other one is reduced size. And so you can imagine that uh, for Titanus giganteus, one of the largest beetles in the world, the life-size beetle doesn't even fit on the page, but in order to get a full look at it, it's been shrunk down considerably. If you like beetles, if you like really good photography and just want a nice overview of beetles of the world on a family level, this is an excellent uh, publication. Um, 
once I began working on the Eastern book, um, I started to have in the back of my mind if, if uh, Princeton University Press would have me again and take a chance on me again, I'd love to do the Western book. And so I started thinking in my mind um, how to start piecing that together, even though I hadn't quite finished the Eastern book yet. My family, fortunately, was in Southern California at that time. So I made annual visits back and did a lot of trips. I um, made five trips between 2010 and 2018. I call those the Buena tours. For any of you that are on my Facebook page, Dr. Art Evans Entomologist, you may be familiar with uh, my photo albums covering these different trips. And I've highlighted the areas that I visited here uh, during these five years. And during that time, I drove just under 10,000 miles to photograph as many species of beetles as I uh, possibly could. And of course, one of my favorite places to visit is Arizona, and in particular, the Arizona Sky Islands. And the uh, Madrian Sky Islands include about approximately 27 uh, mountain ranges uh, that are found in the United States and in northern Mexico. Uh, the major sky islands include the Baba Kivris, the Chiricahuas, Huachucas, Pinaleños, uh, Santa Catalinas, and Santa Rita Mountains. Some of these names I'm sure are familiar to uh, many of you here in uh, southeastern Arizona. And what uh, um, one of the many things that I found fascinating about this, the fact that they're called sky islands, I mean, that really paints a picture. Um, uh, uh, a quote that I love from Weldon Heald, uh, some of the Earth's most interesting islands are nowhere near oceans or lakes. They're strictly land islands, but with a climate, vegetation, and animal life different from their surroundings as they rose from some remote sea. So it was Weldon Heald that coined the term sky islands in a really interesting article that appeared in Natural History Magazine in 1951. Uh, he was a prolific writer, but one of his uh, books that really grabbed my attention was called Sky Island. Later, the same book was entitled The Chiricahua Mountains because it focused on the history, uh, both natural and human history, of the Chiricahuas. And if you're not familiar with this book and you are interested in this part of the world, you can still find copies out there on A Books uh, or any of your favorite used booksellers. It's uh, highly recommended reading. What makes this region of southeastern Arizona so fascinating is all the biotic influences. Um, the uh, mountain chains themselves represent an archipelago that connects the Rocky Mountains in the north with the Sierra Madre uh, Occidental of the south. So you have this blending of temperate and tropical taxa. This not only goes for beetles, but other insects, uh, animals, and plant species too. And then from the west, you have considerable influence from the Northern des Desert. And from the east, you've got both the Great Plains and Chihuahuan Desert influences as well. And there are uh, uh, neotropical taxa, some of which uh, have their northernmost distribution in this region, including southeastern Ar uh, Arizona. So it's almost, uh, it's, it's one of the most biologically rich regions uh, in North America and certainly uh, in the United States next to Southern Texas and Southern Florida. Um, there's no way that beetles of Western North America can adequately cover the richness of uh, the Arizona beetle fauna. So I've launched into another project with Margarita Brummerman. Some of you might be familiar with her uh, online presence and we're doing a book entitled Arizona Beetles. And it's primarily her photography with her beetles uh, mostly beetles that she's photographed on these plates. This is an example of a scarab plate and it'll be my text. And we're covering uh, more than 2,200 species of beetles and 83 families that occur uh, in Arizona. And because she keeps adding species, I keep getting farther behind. And because I've had these other writing projects, I'm a little behind on this book, but I'm approximately uh, about a third of the way through the uh, species diagnoses. And once I've been able to clear some of the decks of these other projects, I hope to get back to this and uh, hope to see it uh, to completion within the next year or so. And now I just wanna uh, wind up my presentation with some of my favorite uh, beetle species, pardon me, I've got something in my eye here, uh, beetle species that are included in the book. Uh, and uh, these are all with few exceptions, my photographs. 
Uh, one of my favorite species that I always enjoy seeing in some uh, uh, stream pools in southeastern Arizona is this relatively large whirligig beetle, the family Gyrinidae, Dinutus sublineatus. They tend to be fairly solitary. Uh, you'll see them uh, swing around the surface of pools and occasionally they will come to uh, lights at night. Of course, whirligigs are amazing because they have completely divided compound eyes with omatidia uh, in the upper portion of the eyes that are adapted for seeing in the air while those uh, down below the water surface are specifically adapted for seeing uh, in water. Um, just, I can't imagine the brain that it requires to uh, uh, interpret those uh, two wildly different uh, types of imagery. Another uh, specialty for Western North America is the diphilostomatids. This is a small group of beetles. Uh, there are only uh, uh, three species known, uh, and this whole family is only known from California. And they uh, were originally described as very aberrant stag beetles. The males are very leggy. Uh, they can fly. They show up in those canals uh, when you uh, scoop up the flotsam and jepsum with the nets. Um, they're day flyers, they don't come to lights, and the females are wingless. And so the specimens are very rarely collected, but some sharp-eyed coleopterists noticed these males flying around in the early morning hours in the summer in the western foothills of the Sierra Nevada, and then saw them land and bury themselves. And sure enough, there was a female right there. So uh, that's how these were uh, picked up. And a real red badge of courage is another uh, Western North America um, specialty, the Pleiacomidae. These are the rain beetles, so named because the males' flight are triggered by fall and winter rains or melting snow in late winter. And usually to collect these beetles, you have to expose yourself to some really crappy weather conditions. It's cold, it's wet, it's miserable. Uh, roads are washed out, trees fall across roads. I mean, it's not easy work. This is uh, Pleiacoma octopagina, um, and it's so named because it's the only species of rain beetle that has eight lamellar uh, uh, antennomeres. And this uh, species is kind of special for me because I collected several of these when I was a kid in a nearby swimming pool in the foothills of the mountains. I had no idea what they were. I took them with me to that first field trip to the Natural History Museum, and it was Bob Duff who recognized them right away, and that's how we connected, because up to that time, these beetles were only known from their type locality, which was about uh, 10 miles away. So this was the first time they'd been found. Turns out they're widespread along the San Andreas Fault in Southern California. Here's a female rain beetle of another species, Pleiacoma lindsayii, and as they, as you can imagine, the, they are flightless. Their flight wings are just little thin strips of chitin, and uh, all they do is come up to the entrance of their burrow, release a pheromone, and attract these males. We've used the females to attract males by caging them, just like some people do with uh, giant silk moths. Of course, any trip to Arizona uh, wouldn't be complete without uh, at least seeing or collecting all three species of Chrysina. And there's a couple of spots in Arizona uh, in the mountains where you can collect all three species in the same place, not necessarily at the same time. My experience is that Chrysina lacanti, which is a pine feeder, tends to fly early and at dusk whereas uh, Chrysina gloriosa and Byri um, will fly throughout the evening. Uh, the adults of uh, Gloriosa are on junipers, while those of uh, Byri are on oaks. And uh, the larvae of all these species uh, feed on decaying wood. And of course, there are some big bruisers out there. I'm, I'm looking at a lot of scarabs here because they're my favorites. Dynasties Granti uh, and the uh, Strategus Aloeus are, are two big crowd pleasers uh, at any black light or street light where they happen to wind up. Notice the spelling of Grantii. Um, the, single, the spelling with a single I has been a misspelling that's per been perpetuated by myself included for many years. But uh, if you happen to catch this in any uh, manuscripts or collections, displays, label copy, what have you, be sure to add an extra I in there and you'll be with the current usage. Um, the uh, uh, flower chafers are just spectacular. Also in southeastern Arizona, uh, there are several species of euphoria, many of which were only known from Mexico and have only recently been discovered in southeastern Arizona. 
whether these are species that are expanding their range or it's just because there's more people looking for them and people are finding them now is not certain. I see, I believe that they've been there all along. It's just that uh, we haven't been in the right place at the right time. Buprestids are also one of my favorite groups. Um, when I was driving to Arizona one late one night during a storm in the eastern Mojave Desert in southeastern California, I just pulled over in a creosote scrub uh, area just to see what was out. I wanted to put some lights out and the air was buzzing with these relatively large buprestids. They were flying by the hundreds. They're all about uh, uh, three quarters of an inch in length and they're covered with this waxy uh, uh, bloom, if you will, that rubs off very easily. Um, Thrinka pige is another sort of red badge of courage because they tend to be at the bases of sotal. This is a yucca-like yucca plant and you'll notice these serrated edges of their leaves. Uh, you have to have gloves uh, to pull these uh, leaves apart because otherwise it's just like a thousand paper cuts and it can be very miserable going. The click beetles are outstanding in the West. Calculopidius uh, has several different species, many of which are metallic. There are three species of eyed click beetles uh, in, uh, South, or in the Western United States, including Aleus zunianus, which is found uh, in the uh, mountains of southeastern Arizona. One of the interesting uh, click beetles uh, in Southern California is Euthysanius. The males are fairly well known. They fly, they're attracted to lights. They have these very distinctive pectinate antennae. Um, here's a male here, but the females are very unusual in their brachypterus. Not only do they not fly, and they don't have flight wings, the elytra themselves are greatly abbreviated, exposing the elytra. And they are not, uh, these are occasionally found in uh, the foothill areas around Los Angeles. I've never been able to find one. And I didn't think I was gonna be able to include a decent photograph one in the book until one of my friends just happened to photograph one just weeks before I was ready to turn in the manuscript. So timing is everything. The uh, netwing beetles are always one of my favorites just because they're so conspicuous and they're just such interesting uh, soft body beetles. Uh, there are many species found in the, uh, 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 the Southwest in particular. Most of them are boldly or aposematically colored. And uh, lampyrids, uh, here in the East, we take, in the Midwest, we take to, tend to take uh, fireflies or lightning bugs, depending on where you're from. Uh, for granted. Uh, I've got them in my yard here for the first time in my life here in Richmond, Virginia. This is great, but I didn't grow up with them in the West. But we do have lampyrids uh, in Southern California. And once I learned where to look for them, I did find the uh, pink glowworms, which have a, a, are the wingless females, the larva form females that just keep a light on. The males do are attracted to lights when they're stressed. They will f uh, flash their lights ever so briefly, ever so faintly but I would collect them occasionally in the mountains at the lights. But one year I went out, uh, when I first got my camera, I was still shooting slide film and I noticed the females were all over this low rock wall around a parking lot in the national forest. And I was out there with my headlamp and sure enough, I found this female that was being mobbed by uh, three males, only one of which is actually mating with her, but the rest of them are all jockeying for place. And I was glad that I had an opportunity to finally get this photo into the book. The Fengotids are related to Lampyrids. And uh, there are uh, th uh, three genera of Fengotids that are found in the West. Probably the most commonly encountered one is Zarhippus. And this particular species, Zarhippus integrapennis. The males are very conspicuous. They have very soft bodies. Their elytra are relatively short. They have very distinctive mandibles, as you can see here, and they have bipectinate antennae. The uh, larvae and the larva form females have lights along the side of their body. So here's one under normal circumstances. Here's one aglow uh, in the dark. And like all of the other uh, known larvae of Fengotids, the larvae are millipede predators. Now I have to say that uh, this is not my photograph, but this is a larva of an Eastern uh, Fengotes. That's another genus which does occur in Arizona and they are predators. They will run alongside of a millipede and then they will loop their, a coil of their body around its head and very deftly reach uh, underneath and uh, inject uh, a, a 
uh, digestive enzymes into the body of the millipede and they sever the uh, ventral nerve cord and that paralyzes the millipede and prevents it from releasing uh, its defensive chemicals through the repugnatorial glands on the side of its body. And then the larva just pushes the head back and enters the body cavity of the millipede feeding on all its liquefied uh, tissues and organs. Tenebrionids are getting short shrift here and I apologize to Chris and Aaron for that, <laughs> but I'm running out of time here so I gotta keep going. But I just wanted to point out that uh, Idrotes, I know that Chris has been working on uh, it and its relatives. Um, I still remember seeing these for the first time when I was a kid out in the schoolyard in Little Rock, California and filling up my lunch pail. I had a Superman lunch pail that I filled up with these guys when I first found them and took them home and kept them going on little bits of oatmeal for a while. Um, I've always been fascinated by these. And asbolus, um, some people call them the blue death feigners because they practice thanatosis when they're disturbed. Um, uh, under hot, dry conditions, they have this waxy, bluish waxy coating. They're very popular in insect zoos because they're very animated uh, 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 during the, the day even, even though they're primarily nocturnal in the field and they live a long time. Blister beetles have always been one of my favorites. Uh, there are many, many fascinating uh, blister beetles depending on the tribe. Uh, the larvae are ectoparasites of uh, uh, grasshopper eggs in the ground or on the uh, larvae of uh, uh, ground nesting solitary bees. Clarids, checker beetles are just cool. Um, you see them at lights, they all come to flowers. Uh, as far as they're known, they are all predatory, both as larvae and adults. Uh, there are several important species in mountainous areas that are thought to be part of the checks and balances of uh, bark beetles in forests that are managed for timber. In southeastern Arizona, one of my favorites, uh, beetles, they're very common, but still it's like seeing an old friend or these beautiful blue uh, erotylids, these pleasing fungus beetles. Uh, you'll see them flying like trucks in low gear, just very slowly in shaded canyons where there's plenty of fungus abounding. You'll find the adults feeding as well as the larvae. The uh, uh, pupation occurs at the end of the exoskeleton, the last larval instar. And so you'll find uh, on uh, logs that are sort of uh, overhanging, uh, you'll find these masses of larvae that have already uh, in the process of pupating and pupae that are already um, uh, pupa that have already taken place, that have already formed. Cerambicids are certainly popular with collectors. Um, Prionus californicus was a, is a very widespread species that I grew up with on the fringes of the Mojave Desert. An interesting species is this uh, mimic here, Elytroleptus. There are three species of this in the West, and uh, they are predators of netwing beetles. Uh, in fact, this particular species can be found occasionally in the mating swarms of these two species, Lycus simulans and Lycus loripes. There's another species of elytra leptus that's called apicalis that has black tips on the elytra, and it is found in the mating swarms of other species of lysids in southeastern Arizona that have uh, black elytral apices. I have yet to find the cerambicids that way. I just happened to see these uh, on uh, um, oaks that were just starting to form uh, acorns. Uh, several species of longhorns that are associated with cacti in uh, the southwestern United States. Um, these are my favorites just because of the color. Uh, the males have these greatly exaggerated mandibles. I've never collected this species myself, Megapurpura senis, but fortunately I was there a year where others had and I got to photograph them for the book. They emerge every three years and the adults are only out for just a few days. So you have to be in the right place at the right time. And this year in Arizona apparently was a big year for them if you knew what you were looking for. And then finally, I just wanna wrap it up in terms of the beetles with uh, some of the weevils. Uh, this is our, uh, one of our largest weevils, one of our largest native weevils uh, in Western United States that you'll find on uh, cactus. They occur from uh, coastal Southern California to the deserts and uh, grassland areas of Southeastern Arizona and further South, of course. There are, uh, is an introduced species that is uh, going after uh, street palm trees, 
uh, right now and is a serious pest and there's concerns that it may threaten the palm industry which is uh, extensive in the uh, deserts of Southern California. Now I'm not always photographing beetles when I'm out although that's my focus so I just thought I'd share some eye candy for you some of you that may have had enough of beetles already. Uh, most of these were photographed in uh, Arizona and there's some of my favorites. This is one of those examples where I thought a cicada was being very cooperative. And it's only until I started reviewing the photograph in the, in the computer that I realized it was ovipositing. And you can see the little divots in this grass stem where the eggs are being laid. As an aside, I'm working on a project, the Virginia Cicada Project. There are 24 species and subspecies found here in Virginia, including six species of periodical cicadas. And I hope to have a published guide uh, to those as part of the Insects of Virginia series uh, in the not so distant future. And I just happen to be along at the right time uh, only twice if I had a camera in hand when I've seen a pepsis wasp dragging a paralyzed tarantula along. And they move pretty quickly, surprisingly. So I'm glad that my pictures turned out at least reasonably well to share. And this is a sunset picture to wrap things up. Uh, this is from the Patagonia Mountains looking uh, west um, at the Baba Kivris. That's Baba Kivri Peak right there. And finally, this is just, oh, I, I, I want to thank, before I wrap up, I want to thank Chris Worth. Um, Chris Worth invited me to join you all today. I've been looking forward to this. Uh, Chris and I have been friends for a long time. Uh, I met Chris when he was 15 years old. Uh, and we've shared many adventures together in a number of states here in the East and in the West and uh, in the Midwest as well. We went to Ohio as well, I'm thinking of that. And uh, Chris's superb photography has been a part of several of my books. In fact, uh, when I get stuck with a camera question, Chris is my go-to guy. So um, I wanna thank him for uh, inviting me today. And uh, finally, a shameless plug for my book. Uh, if any of you were so inspired, uh, you can order uh, copies of these books anywhere. But if you're interested in an autographed or an inscribed copy of the book, you can go to bioquip.com and look up the special part number that ends in an S, that's for signature. And there'll be a note field there and you can indicate if you want the book or inscribed. And if it's to be inscribed, please indicate to whom uh, the book is subscribed. Well, that's all for me. Uh, I ran a tiny bit long, but I want to thank you very much for joining me today, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much, Art. Uh, I see we've got uh, one question in the Q&A already. Um, Elizabeth Barnes asks, uh, at a recent Lepidoptera Society meeting, there were some members that expressed uh, concern over, sorry, that fewer new lepidopterists were taking up collecting. Is this also true in the coleoptera world as well? What are your thoughts on this change? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, yes, this is a problem across uh, all insect orders. Um, uh, with uh, butterflies and some other popular groups that are relatively small and well known, there isn't necessarily a need to collect uh, large numbers of specimens, but it's always important to collect vouchers. With beetles in particular, there are many uh, conspicuous species that can be reliably identified uh, from their external characteristics, but it's always better to have a specimen in hand because it's the internal uh, reproductive organs that are the key to identifying or getting reliable species identifications. There's a lot of emphasis on photographing insects right now, but not one photograph is going to show you all the characters you need to reliably identify species. You have to have that species in hand. And uh, it's even more important than ever before, as fewer people are going into the field uh, and collecting insects, as fewer people are able to identify uh, insects. As habitats are disappearing, we need to have voucher specimens so we can uh, get specimens reliably identified and have an idea as to the distributions of species. But that's a great question. And also, you talk to any entomologist of any age, um, I imagine I'm relatively old uh, at uh, 64, but if you talk to anyone, especially my generation, but in younger generations, 
many of them got started because they had insect collections. Insect collecting is what propelled them into sciences. They may not have gone into entomology, but they went into other biological scientists and it all started with making insect collections. So it's a very important activity. And we've got another question here. Are, uh, perhaps you could define what uh, exactly a voucher specimen is. Well, a voucher specimen is simply a specimen uh, that is preserved with its locality data. So if all, any of you have made collections uh, in the past for one reason or another, you put a pin in it, you put a label on it that had the basic information, country, state, county, city, latitude, longitude, date, collector, method of collection, that's a voucher specimen. It serves as a placeholder, uh, a physical uh, entity that you can refer back to for all kinds of things. Even if you're not interested in, in collecting insects or making a collection, if you're doing ecological studies and you're mentioning insects, your study is going to have much more scientific value if you collect specimens that can serve as vouchers and you deposit those specimens in a collection where they're available to subsequent researchers. Otherwise, just identifying things to family or simply mentioning that uh, you know this is what we think they were, um, you, you're losing an opportunity to uh, uh, fine tune your work and add to the scientific usefulness of your project. I think on that note, just a, a shameless plug for uh, a place to voucher specimens, the uh, Purdue Entomological Research Collection. Um, talk to myself, uh, talk to uh, Aaron, um, and we're always happy to help um, with those, those kinds of questions. Good. Other questions? I don't see any coming in. There's some questions in the chat, I see. Oh, okay. Just thank you. You're welcome, everyone. <laughs> thank you for joining me today. Appreciate it. Excellent. Well, last call for questions. All right. All right. I'm going to finish it up. I think that's it. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Art. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, some great beetles today. And uh, can't wait to have a, a copy of uh, Beetles of Western North America in hand. Yeah, me too. Um, like I say, like everything else, it's part of a supply chain delay, but that doesn't mean you can't order it now. So check out BioQuip's website and look for that special uh, uh, number so you can get a signed copy if you would like. They'd be happy to sell you an unsullied copy too that I will never touch. So, <laughs> all right, take care, everyone. <laughs>